Um, I cannot call you T-Bone. Um, I've, I've admired your work for such a long time. Thanks for joining us, Deer Talk Now today. I, I, oh, I, I see you have some go gobblers in the background. That's what I'm thinking about right now. Yeah, I, I just changed that out according to the season. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. No, I'm, te I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Thanks oh, for having me. Absolutely. Um, you know, I was telling some of the guys here about your background. Your background is not that much different than mine. Um, you, you started, you hunt, you hunted public land a lot growing up. Um, you you started with a small property, and that's one of the things I think with you being a celebrity, and I know that might make you a little bit uncomfortable, but you are. Over a half million people on Facebook follow you. You've had all those years on TV, but you've basically learned how to do this the hard way, especially in Georgia, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. I, um, me, Michael, and uh, Nick, we we all come up with uh, humble beginnings, I guess you could say. And, you know, we didn't have two nickels to rub together to start off with. And uh, fortunately, we had a, a, a father and, you know, uncles and stuff that were, you know, passionate about this and, you know, which which impregnated us with the passion. And, you know, if, if you got a desire for it, you find a way. Absolutely. You know, I remember when Michael first started, he was lugging around a camera for those guys. And, uh, you know, he was just a heck of a hunter. But yeah. um, just just that that will to that drive to want to, uh, you know, learn how to outsmart deer and turkeys. That's that's something that's just born within you. I think no matter where you grow up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, a lot of people that say they're not hunters or they actually are you know women and you know whoever it is you know you wake up in the morning and you're you're hunting the toilet or you're hunting the biscuit so uh, you're a hunter <laughs> <laughs> you are a hunter i don't know how about how many gatherers but I, I know we're all hunters um that's right so take us i know you've done a million of these podcasts and and you've you've told your story a million times like i have over the years but you started back uh, picking up a compound bow, what, late 80s? Yeah, that's L right. Uh, graduated high school in 86. Uh, I, you know, of course, I was hunting since I was five or so. My dad had bought me a, a a recurve when I was like 10 for, you know, having good grades. And I had a bad experience because uh, he bought me a bow that was too much for me. So, you know, I couldn't pull it. And then, uh, you know, some buddies of mine, uh, I got in a hunting club with them and we were hunting public ground like you had mentioned to earlier. And uh, you know, they said, Hey, are you going to, you know, you're going to bow hunt with us. And, and I said, well, you know, I, I really just a gun hunter basically, and really cared more about fishing back then. And, and they, they said, well, look, man, you get to lengthen your season. We're going to be uh bow hunting and stuff. So, you, you know, you ought to go ahead and get a bow. So, you know, through peer pressure, I guess I uh, bought me a compound on a Wednesday and we learned about our local archery club while we were there at the store buying my bow. And uh, that Sunday they were having a 3d competition, which, you know, I was like, man, I'm not going to that. I've only owned a bow five days. And <laughs> we all went, <laughs> never, n never had shot a, a archery competition. We all entered into the novice uh, division and, um, you know, a blind hog, a blind hog found an acorn. And I, I was fortunate enough to win. And, uh, you know, and I, it sparked me to, you know, Hey, I, I think I might be good at this archery stuff. So, you know, I'd, I played sports through high school and stuff, but I never was any good, just a big guy on a line. All I was, and, I think I might have found something I was pretty good at, which was uh, which was archery, and I and I'm so glad I did. And he was he became very proficient, by the way. Uh, won your first state title in 1991, world championship in 1991. How was that for you? I mean, that was like going from, like you said, if you want to use the sports comparison, going from never even playing to boom, you're you're like at the top of the game. How, yeah. How did that happen? Yeah. How did you, did you teach yourself? Did you have other people showing you how to shoot or? Um, I, I get, you know, back then there was no internet, you know, of course, you know, you couldn't look up stuff. So I, I just became a sponge, you know, anything between uh, me and my friends would go to the local uh, sporting goods or, or archery shop and we'd rent hunting videos as well as, you know, but you know, the, the Dan Fitzgerald, the, oh, yeah. the way back when, uh, you know, watching those type of videos. And then also, magazines deer and deer hunting uh you know uh all, all looking at all the magazines reading the articles uh 
you know, anything that Chuck Adams wrote or, uh, you know, uh, one of my idols from back then this com- competitive wise is Randy Ulmer, which, you know, he and I are friends even to this day. So, wow. um, you know, I just, I couldn't read, I couldn't get enough of it. You know, anything that was about it, I was just a, a sponge. I would ask people when we go to competitions, you know, I couldn't wait to go to each 3d competition each weekend. And those that were, you know, seasoned veterans, I just, you know, became a sponge and, um, you know, slowly but surely just kept getting more knowledge and just was so passionate about it. You know, when you're passionate about something, you, you can invest, you know, 80 hours a week and it doesn't even seem like a job, you know, it, it, it's just something that you just can't get enough of. And, and, and it's really that way to this day. I still am that way. It's just a student of the game and student of the industry. And that's, I mean, your passion is obvious, the talent is obviously there um, from art from the archery standpoint. Now, I'm going to ask you this. I do believe back in the day, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you shot Browning's uh, bows. Yeah, when um, my uh, the first team or, or first uh, pro staff I, that I was a part of was, yeah, Browning. They, they had asked me to become on their, their staff uh, late 1990, 91, and I was with them for – three years and then PSC and then uh, I've been with Hoyt since 1996. What what was the very first compound that you shot? Um, very first compound that I that well the one that I bought that day um, was a um, Strata flight a PSC Strata flight express. PSC Strata flight yeah everybody yeah. remember you, you remember your first car you remember your first bow mine was a yeah. Darton Trailmaster I think I bought it in I think it was 1989, somewhere around, around in there. And the only reason I bought it yeah. is it came with six arrows, um, a, a quiver, you know, and it was like $149. And I just remember, yep. like, that is so much. I could not believe that is so much money. I was making $3.35 an hour, and I, I'm like, I could not believe it. But I, I'll never – I still, I got it. I got the bow back after – Oh, it, did you? Gave it away like 20, 30 years ago. And then um, it was actually to a gal that um, <clears throat> used to work at Krause Publications that published our magazine. And this was, what, like five years ago? I just, on a whim, I said, Ted Nugent said, you should see if you can get it back. And I yeah. asked her, she said, yeah, I still got it, and I got it back. Do you still have your first uh, bow? No, no, I don't. I don't. I've, uh, I've got uh, the, the last bow that I purchased, which was, in you know, in 1990, which was a Martin speed flight i do have that one the one that i won the state championship with oh that's cool uh, i do have that one but the uh, i had two or three before that that i that i don't have i wish i would have kept all of mine i i have yeah. i've shot matthews since 97 and i've given them to people here at work and you know so they could get and that is uh gratifying to see somebody take yeah. up archery um but you, yeah. you look at those old bows um, maybe not so much the math. Like back, if you go back into the '80s and stuff, and I mean, friends of mine, my brothers who were uh, eight, ten years older than me, they had like pro lines and stuff like that. When you, when oh, you yeah. look at them, and that is like history. Um, oh on, yeah, on the wall. So I know. Okay, yeah. so you went through this <clears throat> meteoric rise to a, a world champion shooter. You, uh, well, you open your own archery shop. I don't know if a lot of people know that. This guy knows his stuff. If you go to his videos, I, and I, you, you're going to help me with this, Travis, but uh, the, the, the Bone Collector YouTube page, there's other places where you give tips, and I want to talk about some of that stuff. You open your own archery shop. Was that your only thing that you were doing then? Was that your quote-unquote job, you were running the archery shop? Well, um, when I first started archery, I worked for Mercedes Benz in Atlanta. I did uh, interior work, and we covered uh, all the service for the interior for the three. There's three large dealers in the Atlanta area, and we did all the service work for them. And, you know, uh, anything interior related, restored old Mercedes, but we just strictly worked on Mercedes, and that was it. So I did that uh, up until 93, and then in 93 um, – uh, you know, I said, you know, I just don't want to do this. I didn't want to fight the traffic in Atlanta. You know, I, it, it, being a country boy, that just wasn't for me, fighting the traffic going in and out of Atlanta. So I took a huge pay cut, went to work in an archery pro shop, 
because I said, you know, while I'm young and don't have any responsibilities, I don't have, you know, a wife, a kid or anything like that, or a house note. I said, I can afford to take a pay cut. I'm not putting anybody else in, uh, you know, dire straits. So with that said, I, um, you, you know, took the burden on myself. I said, I want to pursue something that I love, which I loved archery. I worked in a pro shop for two years, kind of learned the ins and out of the retail side. And me and a buddy of mine, um, you know, I moved an hour and a half south of Atlanta, which was where all the better hunting and fishing was. And we opened up our own shop. And uh, anybody that's ever opened up a shop or even opened up their own business, boy, there's, I mean, there's some tough times the first two or three years. So, I tell everybody this physique was probably built on bologna sandwiches and pizza rolls and stuff for, <laughs> for the first three or four years. Cause boy, I'm telling you the cash register wasn't ringing, but uh, eventually we caught traction. Um, I shot, you know, I shot, l- luckily I had some contracts with companies and I uh, toured around the country shooting uh, in these tournaments and that helped subsidize my income. And uh, the, the store caught traction uh, around the mid nineties. Um, uh, I met, David Blanton, Michael Waddell, the guys at Real Tree, which is 45 minutes south of where I'm at now, and we became good friends. And the the store got good traction and notoriety, and um, you know, th- then we carved out a living. So yeah, I opened up my own store. Uh, I, I bought my partner out two years after we had opened, uh, and then you know I had the store for 12 years, and uh, you know I actually sold my business in 2006 or seven after uh, we had. Uh, you, you know, kind of got a good foothold with doing stuff with Realtree and Jeff Foxworthy uh, on, you know, camera and doing the outdoor industry. And then, of course, uh, we started Bone Collector in late 2007 and 2008. Wow, it's been that long already? Wow. Yeah. 2007. Yeah. Um, so I do recall, I think Michael actually might have been telling me once, weren't you like setting up everybody's bows there too? Like with, with not only Realtree, but a lot of people they had on television? Yeah. So, so in, um, once I met them, you know, David Blanton lives in the same town, you know, I I basically rolled the dice. It, it, if, if you've ever, it, it, you know, if you're in the industry and you can attest to this, I'm sure for, for all the years and stuff, but you see ads, you know, a lot of these companies that have ads and the guy would be holding the bow and you could tell he'd never shot a bow before and his draw links too long or there wouldn't be a peep sight in the string and you know that kind of things it didn't look authentic so that kind of thing that that kind of bothered me and then plus you'd see people hunting on tv and me being a you know a a tournament uh person you know i just couldn't get enough of it you know no matter how accurate no matter how good you are in archery you can always get better so i kind of rolled the dice and and told david you know not that i'm the archery god by no means but i just said listen um you know for you guys, you know, you're the premier number one uh, hunting show, hunting DVD, and back then it was VHS sales. I would love to be a liaison or anything that I can do to help you guys, uh, you know, as far as uh, setting up your bows, getting arrows fletched, uh, you know, anybody that you're having, whether it be a country singer, baseball player, introducing someone to the archery, if I can just help them get on uh, you know, the, the, the right path, you know, basically like a tailor fitting a suit to you. Once you start and have a great experience, you're going to spread the positive positivities of archery and bow hunting to the rest of the world. And that, that relationship just worked really, really good. And, and even to this day, I'm still, you know, that's what brought me to the dance, so to speak. So I'm still setting up, you know, uh, you know, people within the industry or anybody that needs help. And then like you had mentioned earlier, you know, doing tips and stuff, you know, and, and, and I hope this comes across, you know, as humble or appreciative. I'm by no means, there's a lot of great, uh, you know, archery gurus out there and a lot of uh, knowledge to be learned throughout YouTube and, 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 you know, the pages of magazines and stuff like that. But, you know, I, 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 you know, hopefully I'm helping people uh, when I give little tips and, and, and still setting up bows for, uh, you know, celebrities and people within the industry and, and close friends and stuff. So I'm still doing that, you know, even today. I've watched a lot of your videos and I appreciate everything that you put out there. And plus it is, you are humble about it because you do say there's a million different ways you can do this or that. And I want to get to some of these questions actually um, in a minute. But um, so I, I, I do want to touch on that. Well, first of all, um, Bone Collector, you guys are still... Where, where is Bone Collector today? I mean, you started in 2007. What is Bone Collector in 2024? Still doing well. Uh, you know, a great website. Uh, and and still we're, uh, you know, a top tier show that's on the Outdoor Channel as well as 
you know, one of the most uh, watched on My Outdoor TV, which is a streaming service where you can go and, you know, watch all the old episodes of Bone Collector. Uh, we still do 23 originals a year. You know, a lot of shows are just a two quarter show, third and fourth quarter. But, you know, we're real fortunate. We do 23 originals a year. Um, you know, we're, we're still going strong on my outdoor channel. I mean, on uh, outdoor channel. And then also, you know yourself, this is a time to pivot, so to speak. You know, we're in a transitional time where things are between digital and uh, streaming and, and television and stuff like that. Uh, and then, of course, social media. So we're real, real fortunate that we kind of have a, a pretty decent foothold in all of those areas. And, uh, you know, we're basically just spitting out content and ready to move in whichever channel the future holds us. And we're so thankful that there's so many people out there that still like our show and our message, which we hope uh, is more than just, um, you know, basically a bunch of guys killing critters and stuff like that. We hope it's a lifestyle. We hope that people see that it is a brotherhood and that, you know, they, they kind of see their own hunting camp within our show. And then, yeah, the cherry on top is we are killing a few critters, but it's not ego based around, Hey, look at the 200 inch buck I killed. You know, we all want to do that, but at the end of the day, we have to, we have to have fun doing it. And um, we, we say there's a lot of people out there that are out hunt us, but there's nobody that's going to out fun us. So that, that is a hundred percent, a hundred percent true. And, yeah, uh, and hope- one thing that Michael, he actually put on Twitter X or whatever you call it now. Um, this was just recently. Um, he said, he's kind of over the whole, you know, trophy thing. It's not that he doesn't want to kill a big buck. Every, everybody yeah. likes that. But it in that is something that Realtree specifically, it was that lifestyle. What, what was there? It was always like uh, faith, family, in the outdoors, whatever the one thing that Bill came up with back in the day. And it is true. And you see that. I've seen it um, not only in Realtree, but uh, I, I think what you guys brought to it is that fun factor without being disingenuous. And I think that is has helped. I know a lot of people have modeled it, and I think a lot of people have um, uh, adopted the life, outdoor lifestyle more, uh, embraced it more because of it. And I think that's a testament to what you guys have brought to – it's been – what is it? It's been over 15 years. So, I mean, it's like – that. that's pretty uh, – something, I think, hang your hand on. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and the and the phrase was family, friends, and the outdoors. That's it. Real true. Yeah. yeah, and uh, – you know, and it all kind of started even more so than that because basically we all got our ben- me, Michael, and Nick got our uh, beginnings from Realtree, which uh, which was Realtree Road Trips. You know, that started back in two thousand and three, which was, you know, uh, no pun intended, a different kind of hunting show. And Michael started that, and uh, you know, and then me and Nick was you know guest host with that, and 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 on that show as well. So, you know, it all started from back then, and you know. Um, at the end of the day, you know, you know, it's first come first serve as far as the hunting hunt, hunting goes, you know, you know, if the 200 incher walks out there first, by all means, we're going to let him have it. But, you know, if a, a, a mature 135 comes by, he's going to he's he's arrow worthy as well. That's 100%, <laughs> I agree with you on that. And in my case, I, you could knock a few inches off of that. But um, yeah, we, we won't go there. Deer Talk Now is brought to you by. The all-new Edge 2 Pro from Moultrie Mobile. Never miss a moment with a 0.3 second trigger speed and a 100 foot detection range. Reduce false triggers, extend battery life, and fine-tune your captures with Moultrie Mobile's latest AI integrated technology. For more information, visit MoultrieMobile.com. Okay, so let's get to, these are actually some of the, the call, I, we're not gonna get to all of this. Um, I know that you, I don't want to say preach, but you emphasize uh, uh, at least four things. Um, now, this would be when you, the thing I appreciate when you say anybody can learn anything, whether you've got 30 or 40 years of archery experience or one year of archery experience, um, you can always tweak things. And the four building blocks that I've picked up from what you have written about and what you have done in your videos would be um, arrow building. Um, speed considerations, FOC, and broadheads. So let's go through those four quickly. Um, tell me, in your opinion, to you, what makes what is the best combination for a hunt a deer hunting arrow? Yeah, uh, 
for for deer hunting and, and when i speak just to generalize this i try to speak of the the meat and potatoes of the billy joe lunch bucket the average hunter which is a 28 inch draw to 30 inch draw you know it, a, absolutely the application is going to change based off if you're a shorter draw length or you can't pull a you know uh you know 60 to 70 pounds but a 60 to 70 pounds 28 to 30 inch draw um what what i like to do if you're talking with a bow that is you know, a new bow that is, you know, three to four years old or, or you know, not a real old bow. Um, there's a speed range that I, that I like to, I, I think that the speeds that are, that are published, you know, of IBO of 340 and 50 feet per second, that's not, un, that's unrealistic in my opinion. And that's unnecessary speed. Deer and deer hunting, you know, we're talking, uh, most of your shots are going to be under 40 yards uh, anyway. So with that said, you know, 320 feet per second is not going to be used until you shoot way beyond 50 yards so let's 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 harness that energy and let's harness that speed into a uh, a heavier era and a more lethal era and a better penetrating a more forgiving and a, a quieter bow so with that said is pull the most weight that you can comfortably pull not not one that you're walking all around let's just say that you end up harnessing down to 67 pounds is where you're comfortable at you can shoot that then you take an arrow and let's just start with like say 475 to 500 grain arrows shoot that through the meter with your draw length and everything that you have set up see where you're at you know if you're at 300 feet per second that lets you know that you know i can trim some fat off of that speed i can manipulate that arrow i can go with a heavier point weight i can go with a heavier insert system uh and i can go with a heavier arrow if i want to a, a, a stiffer spine Keep the pounds the same, and then you can basically trim that back so that you're in that, let's just say 260 to about a 285 range. To me, that seems to be the best uh, hunting speeds, meaning like you're not giving up too much on trajectory, but yet you can afford to put all your your build and your efficiency into a good quality arrow with a higher percentage of FOC, and you're not giving, giving up anything on the... Um, uh, on the trajectory that is most needed under 40 yards, if that makes sense. Yep. hundred percent. Yep. Uh, so that, that's what I, I, I mean, all things need to be considered, but, but the, the speed range, once you've determined your draw length and you determine the comfortable poundage, then I try to land somewhere in that, you know, you could even go down to 250 to 250 to 290 at the very top end. And somewhere in there, you're going to find the perfect arrow with the right FOC uh, the, the FOC is going to be more accurate. It's going to be more forgiving and it's going to help you in the wind. Uh, there are so many advantages to that as well as a heavier arrow makes the bow perform better. Uh, it's quieter, uh, not as much stress on the bow and it's going to be more forgiving and accurate. So, um, that, that's what I try to go to. And, and with, uh, for deer and deer hunting, of course, um, I'm a fan of, at the end of the day, there's a lot of great broadheads out there. I mean, a lot of great broadheads. And, the, and the, the, the most important thing is putting it where it counts. You know, accuracy always wins. I mean, that's going to be my headline on my tombstone. Accuracy wins. So, you know, no matter how fast you are, no have heavier arrow, no matter what, if you can't hit what you're aiming at, you know, then, you, you know, that that's you're leaving things to chance. Accuracy is always going to win. So accuracy is the most important thing. But with a broadhead, <clears throat> whether it's a fixed blade, whether it's a, a expandable, I'm not a fan of the expandables that fold back over themselves, but I am a fan of expandables that are rear deploying that slide into place. And uh, uh, of course, it's not much of a secret, but the dead meat uh, or the mega meat, which is an exposed blade. So even if it miraculously didn't open the blades are exposed it's still going to do some cutting but then it's a three blade system instead of the normal two blade uh expandable so you're getting 33 percent more cut slides into place and uh, you have large holes for deer and deer hunting for the meat and potatoes of the people that that's what i would recommend but of course you know if you're a shorter draw length or lighter poundage or uh you know uh hunting something other than deer or something like that you may want to look into a fixed blade you know, single bevel, uh, you know, a, a sharp fixed blade, things like that. So it depends on the application. I don't want to just say this is a, you know, one broadhead or one system for everybody, but we're, we're strictly talking about the meat and potatoes of the hunters. You mentioned Randy Ulmer before and Ulmer edge was that broadhead before 
before uh, Sever came along. Um, you know, that's what I've been shooting. And I don't shoot a lot of weight. Um, I'm down to th- – and that actually came from Ted Nugent and Mark Drury, who, who both went down <clears throat> 20 years ago. And I, I'm down to yep. fi- I'm down to 54 pounds just because that's what's comfortable with me. But you you got so much into that couple minutes that you talked about there. I wanted to back up and talk about. So in your opinion, I know these all go together, but you get on the internet now, and you you mention anything about your weight of your arrow setup, your your arrow with your broadhead. And there's so much out there. I mean, there, everybody yeah. wants to put a, a magical number on it. You mentioned 475 <clears throat> to 500. Um, does it make a Does it make a lot of difference in those hunting deer, deer hunting ranges, or are you more concerned with FOC? I mean, the, the, just the, the sheer weight of the 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 arrow, um, or, yeah. or or opposed to how everything is going together. Well, um, you, you know, th- there's so many different combinations and there's so many different uh, applications. Something that we need to start breaking down because so many, it gets thrown around. Like you said, it's being talked about so much for the last two or three years and even it's still being talked about. A lot of people say heavy arrows. Well, one person's heavy arrow may be a 550 grain arrow. And then another person's heavy arrow doesn't even begin until 650. Or another person's arrow is a heavy arrow. Wow, you're shooting 475. That's a heavy arrow. So we need to just talk about the weights, you know, basically. So to me, a heavy arrow is 600 and beyond. Um, I like, you know, to me, for most anything in North American continent uh, is I like the benchmark to be around 500 grains. However, you know, I'm not going to condone condone someone that wants to shoot 450 grains, uh, you know, I just know. and, And by all means, all these projectiles, if they're, if they're accurate and you're putting them where they're supposed to be and you have a good sharp broadhead, they're going to do the trick. I, I totally get that. But the, um, the FOC, I mean, it's been proven that it's better in the wind. It's more forgiving. Um, so, so I lean more towards that 12 to 16% FOC, try to achieve that no matter what weight uh, a broadhead or, or what weight total arrow weight that you're shooting. Um, and even more so if you want to, and that's why I talk about if you're working on that, that speed range of, you know, say 250 to 280, there's so many different combinations that you can do. You know, like I can go to a little lighter grains per inch shaft and up my, uh, you know, a stiffer spine, lighter grains per inch, and then I can up the FOC. So I've got the mass weight of a 475, but then uh, my FOC may be 18%, which is great. You know, that, that's even that's even better by putting the mass weight up front. So there's a, you know, just like when, you know, a guy that hand loads all his rifle, uh, you know, his bullets and stuff, there's just so many different combinations. And and at the end of the day, I mean, don't get, don't get me wrong, it's real important to to have a system that you're confident with, but I would, I would encourage, you know, I'm going to throw you a curveball here, more people spend time shooting and working on themselves, you know, as far as uh, muscle memory and learning, you know, and shooting, because that's way more important than you, most people can't even shoot the difference, whether you're 1% more FOC or 10 grains uh, of arrow weight, you can't shoot the difference. It, these are all just hurdles that you're trying to achieve in your head. Once you've got a well-tuned bow and an appropriate spined arrow and the FOC and the weight range is where it needs to be, work on yourself you know let's work on perfect practice so that you have great muscle memory so that you become a well-oiled machine to duplicate and be really consistent amen to that that's that's one thing i I wish i would have thought of that because for me people see me shoot on tv and they're like oh you got terrible form this and i'm like i don't know it works for me i keep my shots under 30 yards but what travis is saying here is and you know me the arrow has got to be in the spot and the broad number one accuracy number one number two that broadhead has to be and Bob Rob taught me this one it has to be scary sharp it has to be like yep. when you pull that thing out I don't care what you're shooting when you pull that out of your quiver you better be afraid that if you cut yourself you're gonna bleed and uh, yep. those two things are are very important okay you basically knocked those four right out of the park um, I want to move over now and talk about um, uh, rests 
releases and sites. And just give me a couple talking points. <clears throat> you know, there's there's a lot of confusion, especially for some of the newer the newer hunters. Um, you know, what sh- what should I be worried about, or what should I be concerning myself? Somebody walks into your shop and says, "Travis, rest, release, and sights." Give me your elevator speech on those three aspects of the equation. Yeah, once you've chosen the bow that you want, you know, something that you'd like, of course, that's the nucleus in which you're going to start your setup. So you've chosen your bow, and there's a lot of great bows out there, you know, and manufacturers. But once you've chosen your bow and you're at the archery pro shop and you've got, uh, you know, the appropriate draw length, appropriate poundage that you want, now it's time to start uh, setting up your accessories. And, I, and I'm kind of uh, – you know, on the side of, I understand that everybody's got a budget. So with that said, we just can't go out there and throw $4,000 and say, give me the best of everything. So I tell people that if you have to trim fat on your setup, there's a few things that you don't want to skimp on. And the first and most important is a rest, meaning make sure you get a, that doesn't mean you have to spend $300. That just means make sure you get a really well-built tight tolerance rest, because if the rest that you have has a lot of slop in it, or it's not performing consistently, you can have a crappy rest and you can spend $600 on a site and that site is not gonna make up for that crappy rest. So the nucleus of accessories is the rest. Spend your money on a a good rest, which is gonna serve you well. So you have a a really great rest. I am a fan of a drop away. That seems to be the most, uh, if a drop away is not in your budget, the next thing I would go to, and I know some people are gonna laugh at me, but I'm not, I'm not a, uh, you know, I'm not against a whisker biscuit, you know, as far as a economical, get the job done, accurate, consistent rest. Uh, if you're not going to go the route of a drop away, a whisker biscuit is a, is a, a great, you know, third, fourth choice down the line. So I'm not against a whisker biscuit, but let's just say that we're getting the best of the best. I would get a drop away rest. Make sure you get one with really tight tolerances, one that has adjustability up and down and left and right. There are some out there that don't have any adjustment up and down, and you want to be able to adjust that so that you get it in the appropriate center shot. Then we go on to the release. Uh, release, uh, um, I, I'm assuming most everybody's probably going to be shooting a D-loop. I'd say 99% of everybody shoots a D-loop. Um, I am a fan, I think, in my opinion, that a, a gated release, whether it's a handheld or whether it's a wrist strap, most beginning archers or people that don't shoot a lot are probably going to use a wrist strap with an index finger. And then with that said, I highly recommend a, a gate or, you know, a hook to where it just dumps. That seems to be the cleanest and spent, you know, don't be afraid to spend a little money on a good release that has a good sear in it to where you don't have any creep and it has good uh, pressure and has good adjustability on it. You know, something that has a little movement is going to just like a crappy trigger on a rifle is going to make you, you know, uh, lose confidence. So spend money on tight tolerances on a good, uh, release. A hook is my first favorite. And then the next, if you're not and a lot of people have a hang up of hooking that on a string, they want total capture on the D loop. When you go to that, um, well, I would go to a single caliper to where you have a stationary post and then it opens just on one side. Uh, that would be my next. And the reason why is because when it just opens on one side, it gives that uh, D loop direction, whether you have it in a, if you're torquing it one way or another, it still has to slide down that stationary jaw. So that would be my, my second choice. And then uh, I try to stay away from a double caliper. And the reason why is because if you have torque like this, uh, a lot of times when it opens, it, it wants to go one side or the other. And then always make sure that whatever release it is, when you touch the trigger, it wants to spring open rather than you see some of them that you have to pull the trigger. When you pull the trigger, the jaws open and then grab the D loop. When it grabs the D loop, that means when you're opening the jaw, you're, the spring is keeping it shut. So you're having to pry it apart and it does what I call the fat man squeeze. So you're always going to have friction with the D loop coming out of the caliper. So it's always going to want to touch the caliper. So stay away. I, I mean, all of these will work okay, but you know, if we're putting them in sequences, Hook first, single caliper second, double caliper that springs open third, and then fourth, but try to stay away from those that say sprung close a double caliper. And then, uh, of course, same holds true if you shoot a handhold because the, the trigger mechanism is basically the same. It's just it's with a T-handle. A lot of people like to go to the T-handle. They all can be very accurate. The way you execute it 
the most efficiently is with back tension so that you're, you know, pulling through the shot and squeezing the shot rather than punching the trigger. A lot of people go to the T handle just cause they can anchor better or it's a, uh, it looks more tournamenty or they makes it look like they know what they're doing. But at the end of the day, no matter what release you choose, the most important thing is execution on it. Uh, you know, back tension and making sure that you execute that release, no matter what kind it is to the best of its ability. So that's where form and technique comes in. Then as far as sight, a sight is personal preference, meaning like your how you're aiming with, that's just like when you're buying a rifle scope, what type of crosshairs you have, you know, uh, one person's eye, you know, I personally don't like a multicolored pins, you know, a lot of people, and I see the advantages to it. And this is just, you know, not saying that people should do this, but like, I understand why you have a green, a red, a orange, a yellow, that kind of thing, so that you can differentiate between the yardages. But me, my eye likes the the green so that they're, no matter what lighting condition it is, I can see them all the same and equal. And then what I'll end up doing is painting the stem. I personally like horizontal pins. I never have been one, you know, they're real popular to where you have the vertical pin and then you'll have you know, uh, marks in there. I like to be able to see in between my pins so that, you know, we know the trajectory of the arrow is always this way. I like to be able to see the depth of where I am on the animal so that if I'm Kentucky windage, I'm a fixed pin guy and I'm a deer hunter. So, you know, anything under 50 yards, a deer coming in on the rut, I don't want to have to be adjusting it. I want to be able to hold a little high, hold a little low, see if I'm going to be able to um, get it under a limb or you know, I'm going to, all that is being told with the story of horizontal pins. So that's why, you know, I like horizontal pins by all means, whatever you're aiming with, you have to have the utmost confidence. So that's what I say with your aperture, you choose what your eye likes and what you're comfortable with. And you have the most confidence in. And as far as the makeup of the site, you know, most all sites, I mean, up until the last two years, I mean, I was hunting with a $39 uh, dead ringer site. So that's where you can, you know, it, it, it's it's not micro adjustable. It has windage left and right and gang adjust up and down. And it had all the features that I needed. But there are some really nice sites out there in, in this day and age that can do a lot of things. Make sure your site is, if you're taking longer shots, of course, that it's capable of being leveled first axis, second axis and third axis. There are a lot of nice sites out there that do a lot of nice features. And now I'm glad for the last couple of years I'm, I've been shooting uh uh, uh, it's a best of both worlds. So I can, I've got a, um, a mover as well as fixed pins so that, you know, while me and my friends, it's always nice, you know, yeah, I'm not going to shoot a deer probably beyond 50 yards ever, uh, the rest of my life. However, it sure is nice to be able to play around and work on your confidence shooting at hundred and 120 yards and, you know, shooting at animals in the yard, it, it, it adds, uh, to your confidence and stuff. So I've got the best of both worlds. Plus, Who's to say that I don't shoot a deer at 30 yards and the deer drops and I make a mistake and hits it and it runs out there at 90 yards and is wounded. It'd be nice to know that I could dial it up and get a second arrow into it. You know, that's worst case scenario. You hope you never have to do it, but if you practice that, you're consistent enough to do so. So there are a lot of nice sites out there. Just research them, you know, and, and look at all the features. Um, uh, and again, if we break it back down, I always tell everybody, of course, your bow, spend your money on an arrow rest just to, just to uh, reiterate, arrow rest, a good release. Your arrow build is real important because you're going to have this set of arrows for a long time. Carbon arrows will last you seasons and after seasons. Short of you losing them, they're going to last a long time. So spend some money on a good arrow build, good components to where you get good stainless steel because so many people spend all this money, you know, $2,500 on a setup, and then they go buy a $100 set of arrows with cheap 15 cent components in there. And, you know, as soon as you hit a, a bone or a rib or something like that, that that'll just peel out, you know, and, and it once, once the arrow or the broadhead is broke away from the shaft, you've lost all chance of any more penetration. So you want that stuff to stay together. You want that brick wall uh, toughness to be able to go all the way through, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's okay if the, the broadhead's gnarled when it's on the other side of the deer, but the key thing is let's get it on the other side of get, the deer. Let's get, get it through the end. Get it on so, the other uh, side, yes. Yeah, so, so with that said, you know, to, to like, if you're going to have to skimp on the accessories, stabilizer, quiver, I mean, for that matter, you can tote your arrows to the stand in, with a with a five-gallon bucket if you have to, but 
you know, the, the key things. Next season, you can get you a better quiver. Next season, you can get you to play with some stabilizers. But the, um, the, the arrow rest, release, arrow build. Excellent. That is about the best description I've ever heard, um, especially um, your description on the releases was fascinating. Um, I, I knew the rationale, but to hear you describe it, if you guys have problems, sometimes you're looking for uh, you're looking for bigger problems than what you actually are experiencing. It could be something as simple as maybe upgrading your release, or maybe you know, right. um, uh, upgrading upgrading your components, um, things like that. Travis, I would love to sit here all day. I know we can't. Um, I did want to touch on shortly, uh, briefly, and I hope you don't mind. Because so many people follow and so many people ask, you had some health problems. Um, how are you doing? Yeah, um, uh, two years ago, well, uh, two and a half years ago, I was diagnosed with uh, myxofibrosarcoma cancer. Uh, it was in my leg, and uh, you know, it, for those that didn't know, and I uh, had had to have my leg amputated as well as a chunk of my left lung. Kind of made a joke about that. I said, I spent my whole career trying to put sharp objects through lungs of critters. And here I am having to lose part of my left lung. So, um, but anyway, um, since then, which has been a little over two years since I ha had my leg amputated because of the cancer. And um, uh, every four months I have to go for checkups. They don't ever like to say cancer free for some time, but no sign of any cancer uh, doing well there, you know, uh, trying to focus on losing some weight. So uh it's it's slow go, but um, we're we're moving in the right direction. But uh, no, all's good. I'm I'm getting around. I'm able to still you know do a lot of stuff on the farm. I'm still hunting, uh, still shooting my bow regular, working on bows, turning wrenches, and uh, you know still able to hunt. You know turkey hunting, deer hunting. Not traveling quite as much as I used to, and doing speaking engagements as I did before. But you know when once you get to the fourth quarter of our careers like we are now, we we it, it's slow down time anyway. So. Still very much involved in the industry, love the industry, archery, outdoor industry, on the TV show, doing podcasts like this. So, yeah, um, you know, I told my wife, even if I dip septic tanks for a living, I'm still going to be, you know, knee deep in uh, archery stuff. So I, I, I can't get enough of it. So uh, I, thank you for asking. But, yeah, I'm, I'm doing good. Good, good spirits, uh, you know, positive attitude, no matter how bad things look for me. They could always be worse, and you know, no matter how bad things look for me, someone has always got it worse than me. So, you know, I'm grounded, I'm appreciative, and I'm blessed. I've I've far outlived my dreams, so I'm I'm blessed. That is something that I know that all of your fans, me being one, um, appreciate is your attitude. Your your zest for life is 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 apparent, and um, you've taken whatever curveballs have been thrown at you, and you just say keep bringing them. I, I, I think that's something to be, it's very honorable and we, we appreciate th everything you bring. Th this podcast alone, I know people are going to bookmark it. They're going to come back to it. You, you've helped a ton of people. And um, I guess for everybody out there, uh, we, we appreciate everything you have done for the industry. Oh man, it's been my pleasure, man. Archery's done so much for me. Uh, I mean, I, I'll, I'll spend six lifetimes trying to give back. Awesome. Well, Travis, uh, where can people go? They want to find out more about you, want to follow you on social media. Where can they go and find you? Well, of course, you know, anything Bone Collector and Realtree, uh, you know, we're, we're splattered over their, their pages. But for me personally, it's T-Bone Outdoors, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and TikTok. So on all those, uh, we're actually uh, ramping up our uh, YouTube page as well right now. So we're in a uh, a, a, I guess a reconstruction mode, so to speak. Uh, and so uh, shortly we'll be having some stuff on YouTube as well. Awesome. Well, thank you, Travis. We very much appreciate it. And good luck at when you get after those gobblers. I see that one right now, and I just want to go out there and blow a crow call to find out where he's at. I hear you. Hey, hey thanks for having me so much. I appreciate it. All right. For Travis T-Bone Turner, I am Dan Schmidt. Thank you for joining us for the Deer Talk Now podcast. Every Thursday we drop these wherever you can find deer and deer hunting. Um, every podcast platform and the video versions, if you want to watch them, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, you name it. We'll catch you next week for another episode of Deer Talk Now.